Part two, chapter seven of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A message from the city. Sir Francis Walsingham sat in his private room a month after Father Campion's death. He had settled down again now to his work, which had been so grievously interrupted by his mission to France in connection with a new treaty between that country and England in the previous year. The secret detective service that he had inaugurated in England, chiefly for the protection of the Queen's person, was a vast and complicated business, and the superintendence of this, in addition to the other affairs of his office, made him an exceedingly busy man. England was honeycombed with mines and countermines, both in the political and the religious world, and it needed all this man's brilliant and trained faculties to keep abreast with them. His spies and agents were everywhere, and not only in England. They circled round Mary of Scotland like flies round a wounded creature, seeking to settle and penetrate wherever an opening showed itself. These Scottish troubles would have been enough for any ordinary man, but Walsingham was indefatigable, and his agents were in every prison, lurking round corridors in private houses, found alike in thieves' kitchens and at gentlemen's tables. Just at present, Walsingham was anxious to give all the attention he could to Scottish affairs and on this wet dreary thursday morning in january as he sat before his bureau he was meditating how to deal with an affair that had come to him from the heart of london and how if possible to shift the conduct of it on to other shoulders he sat and drummed his fingers on the desk and stared meditatively at the pigeonholes before him his was an interesting face with large melancholy and almost fanatical eyes and a poet's mouth and forehead but it was probably exactly his imaginative faculties that enabled him to picture public affairs from the points of view of the very various persons concerned in them and thereby to cope with the complications arising out of these conflicting interests he stroked his pointed beard once or twice and then struck a handbell at his side and a servant entered if mr lackington is below he said show him here immediately and the servant went out lackington some time servant to sir nicholas maxwell had entered sir francis service instead at the same time that he had exchanged the catholic for the protestant religion and he was now one of his most trusted agents but he had been in so many matters connected with recusancy that a large number of the papists in london were beginning to know him by sight and the affairs were becoming more and more scarce in which he could be employed among catholics with any hope of success it was his custom to call morning by morning at sir francis office and receive his instructions and just now he had returned from business in the country presently he entered closing the door behind him and bowed profoundly to his master i have a matter on hand lackington said sir francis without looking at him and without any salutation beyond a glance and a nod as he entered a matter which i have not leisure to look into as it is not i think anything more than mere religion but which might i think repay you for your trouble if you can manage it in any way but it is a troublesome business these are the facts number three newman's court in the city has been a suspected house for some while i have had it watched and there is no doubt that the papists use it i thought at first that the scots were mixed up with it but that is not so yesterday a boy of twelve years old left the house in the afternoon and was followed to a number of houses of which i will give you the list presently and was finally arrested in paul's churchyard and brought here i frightened him with talk of the rack and i think i have the truth out of him now i have tested him in the usual ways and all that i can find is that the house is used for mass now and then and that he was going to the papists houses yesterday to bid them come for next sunday morning 
but he was stopped too soon he had not yet told the priest to come now unless the priest is told to-night by one whom he trusts there will be no mass on sunday and the nests of papists will escape us it is of no use to send the boy as he will betray all by his behaviour even if we frighten him into saying what we wish to the priest i suppose it is of no use your going to the priest and feigning to be a catholic messenger and i cannot at this moment see what is to be done if there were anything beyond mere religion in this i would spare no pains to hunt them out but it is not worth my while yet there is the reward and if you think that you can do anything you can have it for your pains i can spare you till monday and of course you shall have what men you will to surround the house and take them at mass if you can but get the priest there thank you sir said lackington deferentially have i your honour's leave to see the boy in your presence walsingham struck the bell again bring the lad that is locked in the steward's parlour he said when the servant appeared sit down lackington and examine him when he comes and sir francis took down some papers from a pigeon-hole sorted out one or two and saying here are his statements handed them to the agent who began to glance through them at once walsingham then turned to his table again and began to go on with his letters in a moment or two the door opened and a little lad of twelve years old came in followed by the servant that will do said walsingham without looking up you can leave him here and the servant went out the boy stood back against the wall by the door his face was white and his eyes full of horror and he looked in a dazed way at the two men what is your name boy began lackington in a sharp judicial tone john belton said the lad in a tremulous voice and are you a little papist asked the agent no sir a protestant then how is it that you go on errands for papists i am a servant sir said the boy imploringly lackington turned the papers over for a moment or two now you know he began again in a threatening voice that this gentleman has power to put you on the rack you know what that is the boy nodded in mute white-faced terror well now he will hear all you say and will know whether you say the truth or not now tell me if you still owe to what you said yesterday and then lackington with the aid of the papers ran quickly over the story that sir francis had related now do you mean to tell me john belton he added that you a protestant and a lad of twelve are employed in this work by papists to gather them for mass the boy looked at him with the same earnest horror yes sir yes sir he said and there was a piteous sob in his voice indeed it is all true but i do not often go on these messages for my master mr roger generally goes but he is sick oh ho said lackington you did not say that yesterday the boy was terrified no sir he cried out miserably the gentleman did not ask me well who is mr roger what is he like he is my master's servant sir and he wears a patch over his eye and stutters a little in his speech these kinds of details were plainly beyond a frightened lad's power of invention and lackington was more satisfied ah what was the message that you were to give to the folk and the priest please sir come for all things are now ready this was such a queer answer that lackington gave an incredulous exclamation it is probably true said sir francis without looking up from his letters i have come across the same kind of cipher at least once before thank you sir said the agent and now my boy tell me this how did you know what it meant please sir said the lad a little encouraged by the kinder tone i have noticed that twice before when mr roger could not go and i was sent with his same message 
all the folks and the priest came on the next sunday and i think that it means that all is safe and that they can come you are a sharp lad said the spy approvingly i am satisfied with you then sir may i go home asked the boy with a hopeful entreaty in his voice nay nay said the other i have not done with you yet answer me some more questions why did you not go to the priest first because i was bidden to go to him last said the boy if i had been to all the other houses by five o'clock last night then i was to meet the priest at papist corner in paul's church but if i had not done them as i had not then i was to see the priest to-night at the same place lackington mused a moment what is the priest's name he asked please sir mr arthur oldham the agent gave a sudden start and a keen glance at the boy and then smiled to himself then he meditated and bit his nails once or twice and when was mr roger taken ill he slipped down at the door of his lodging and hurt his foot at dinner-time yesterday and he could not walk his lodging then he does not sleep in the house no sir he sleeps in stafford alley round the corner and where do you live please sir i go home to my mother nearly every night but not always and where does your mother live please sir at four bells lane lackington remained deep in thought and looked at the boy steadily for a minute or two now sir may i go he asked eagerly lackington paid no attention and he repeated his question the agent still did not seem to hear him but turned to sir francis who was still at his letters that is all sir for the present he said may the boy be kept here till monday the lad broke out into wailing but lackington turned on him a face so savage that his whimpers died away into horror-stricken silence as you will said sir francis pausing for a moment in his writing and striking the bell again and on the servant's appearance gave orders that john belton should be taken again to the steward's parlour until further directions were received the boy went sobbing out and down the passage again under the servant's charge and the door closed and the mother asked walsingham abruptly pausing with pen upraised with your permission sir i will tell her that her boy is in trouble and that if his master sends to inquire for him she is to say he is sick upstairs and you will report to me on monday yes sir by then i shall hope to have taken the crew sir francis nodded his head sharply and the pen began to fly over the paper again as lackington slipped out anthony norris was passing through the court of lambeth house in the afternoon of the same day when the porter came to him and said there was a child waiting in the lodge with a note for him and would master norris kindly come to see her he found a little girl on the bench by the gate who stood up and curtsied as the grand gentleman came striding in and handed him a note which he opened at once and read for the love of god the note ran come and aid one who can be of service to a friend follow the little maid master norris and she will bring you to me if you have any friends at great keens for the love you bear to them come quickly anthony turned the note over it was unsigned and undated on his inquiry further from the little girl she said she knew nothing about the writer but that a gentleman had given her the note and told her to bring it to master anthony norris at lambeth house and that she was to take him to a house that she knew in the city she did not know the name of the house she said it was all very strange thought anthony but evidently here was some one who knew about him the reference to great keens made him think uneasily of isabel and wonder whether any harm had happened to her or whether any danger threatened he stood musing with the note between his fingers and then told the child to go straight down to paul's cross and await him there and he would follow immediately the child ran off and anthony went round to the stables to get his horse he rode straight down to the city and put up his horse in the bishop's stables and then went round with his riding whip in his hand to paul's cross it was a dull miserable afternoon beginning to close in with a fine rain falling and very few people were about 
and he found the child crouched up against the pulpit in an attempt to keep dry. Come, he said kindly, I'm ready. Show me the way. The child led him along by the cathedral through the churchyard and then by winding passages, where Anthony kept a good lookout at the corners, for a stab in the back was no uncommon thing for a well-dressed gentleman off his guard. The houses overhead leaned so nearly together that the darkening sky disappeared altogether now and then. At one spot Anthony caught a glimpse high up of Bow Church Spire, and after a corner or two the child stopped before a doorway in a little flagged court. "'It is here,' she said, and before Anthony could stop her she had slipped away and disappeared through a passage. He looked at the house. It was a tumble-down place. The door was heavily studded with nails and gave a most respectable air to the house. The leaded windows were just over his head and tightly closed. There was an air of mute discretion and silence about the place that roused a vague discomfort in Anthony's mind. He slipped his right hand into his belt and satisfied himself that the hilt of his knife was within his reach. Overhead the hanging windows and eaves bulged out on all sides, but there was no one to be seen. It seemed a place that had slipped into a backwater of the humming stream of the city. The fine rain still falling added to the dismal aspect of the little court. He looked round once more, and then rapped sharply at the door to which the child had pointed. There was silence for at least a minute. Then, as he was about to knock again, there was a faint sound overhead, and he looked up in time to see a face swiftly withdrawn from one of the windows. Evidently, an occupant of the house had been examining the visitor. Then, shuffling footsteps came along a passage within, and a light shone under the door. There was a noise of bolts being withdrawn, and the rattle of a chain, and then the handle turned and the door opened slowly inwards, and an old woman stood there holding an oil lamp over her head. This was not very formidable, at any rate. "'I have been bidden to come here,' he said, by a letter delivered to me an hour ago. "'Ah?' said the old woman, and looked at him peeringly. "'Then you are for Mr. Roger?' "'I dare say,' said Anthony, a little sharply. He was not accustomed to be treated like this. The old woman still looked at him suspiciously, and then, as Anthony made a movement of impatience, she stepped back. "'Come in, sir,' she said. He stepped in, and she closed and fastened the door again behind him, and then, holding the oil lamp high over her head, she advanced in her slippers towards the staircase, and Anthony followed. On the stairs she turned once to see if he was coming, and beckoned him on with a movement of her head. Anthony looked about him as he went up. There was nothing remarkable or suspicious about the house in any way. It was cleaner than he had been led to expect by its outward aspect wainscoted to the ceiling with oak, and the stairs were strong and well made. It was plainly a very tolerably respectable place, and Anthony began to think from its appearance that he had been admitted at the back door of some well-to-do house off Cheapside. The banisters were carved with some distinction, and there were the rudimentary elements of linen pattern design on the panels that lined the opposite walls up to the height of the banisters. The woman went up and up, slowly, panting a little. At each landing she turned and glanced back to see that her companion was following. All the doors that they passed were discreetly shut, and the house was perfectly dark, except for the flickering light of the woman's lamp, and silent, except for the noise of the footsteps and the rush of a mouse now and then behind the woodwork. At the third landing she stopped and came close up to Anthony. "'That is the door.' she whispered hoarsely and pointed with her thumb towards a doorway that was opposite the staircase ask for mr roger and then without saying any more she set the lamp down on the flat head of the top banister and herself began to shuffle downstairs again into the dark house anthony stood still a moment his heart beating a little what was this strange errand and isabel what had she to do with this house buried away in the courts of the great city as he waited he heard a door close somewhere behind him and the shuffling footsteps had ceased 
He touched the hilt of his knife once again to give himself courage, and then walked slowly across and rapped on the door. Instantly a voice full of trembling expectancy cried to him to come in. He turned the handle and stepped into the firelit room. It was extremely poorly furnished. A rickety table stood in the centre with a book or two and a basin with a plate. A saucepan hissed and bubbled on the fire. In the corner near the window stood a poor bed, and to this Anthony's attention was immediately directed by a voice that called out hoarsely, "'Thank God, sir! Thank God, sir, you have come! I feared you would not!' Anthony stepped towards it, wondering and expectant, but reassured. Lying in the bed with clothes drawn up to the chin was the figure of a man. There was no light in the room save that given by the leaping flames on the hearth and anthony could only make out the face of a man with a patch over one eye the man stretched a hand over the bedclothes as he came near and anthony took it a little astonished and received a strong trembling grip of apparent excitement and relief thank god sir the man said again but there is not too much time how can i serve you said anthony sitting on a chair near the bedside your letter spoke of friends at great keynes what did you mean by that is the door closed sir asked the man anxiously stuttering a little as he spoke anthony stepped up and closed it firmly and then came back and sat down again well then sir i believe you are a friend of the priest mr maxwell's anthony shook his head there's no priest of that name that i know ah cried the man and his voice shook have i said too much you are mr anthony norris of the dower house and of the archbishop's household i am said anthony but yet well well said the man i must go forward now he whom you know as mr james maxwell is a catholic priest known to many under the name of mr arthur oldham he is in sore danger anthony was silent through sheer astonishment this then was the secret of the mystery that had hung round mr james so long the few times he had met him in town since his return it had been on the tip of his tongue to ask what he did there and why hubert was to be master of the hall but there was something in mr james's manner that made the asking of such a question appear an impossible liberty and it had remained unasked well said the man in bed in anxious terror there is no mistake is there i said nothing said anthony for astonishment i had no idea that he was a priest and how can i serve him he is in sore danger said the man and again and again there came the stutter now i am a catholic you see how much i trust you sir i am the only one in this house i was entrusted with a message to mr maxwell to put him on his guard against the danger that threatens him i was to meet him this very evening at five of the clock and this afternoon as i left my room i slipped and so hurt my foot that i cannot put it to the ground i dared not send a letter to mr maxwell for fear the child should be followed i dared not send to another catholic nor indeed did i know where to find one whom mr maxwell would know and trust as he is new to us here but i had heard him speak of his friend mr anthony norris who was at lambeth house and i determined sir to send a child to you and ask you to do this service for your friend for an officer of the archbishop's household is beyond suspicion now sir will you do this service if you do it not i know not where to turn for help 
Anthony was silent. He felt a little uneasy, supposing that there was sedition mixed up in this. How could he trust the man's story? How could he be certain, in fact, that he was a Catholic at all? He looked at him keenly in the firelight. The man's one eye shone in deep anxiety, and his forehead was wrinkled, and he passed his hand nervously over his mouth again and again. "'How can I tell?' said Anthony, that all this is true. The man, with an impatient movement, unfastened his shirt at the neck and drew up on a string that was round his neck a little leather case. "'There, sir,' he stammered, drawing the string over his head, "'to take that to the fire and see what it is.' Anthony took it curiously, and holding it close to the fire, drew off the little case. There was the wax metal stamped with the lamb, called Agnus Dei. "'There,' cried the man from the bed, "'now I have put, put myself in your hands, and if more is wanted—' And as Anthony came back, holding the metal, the man fumbled beneath the pillow and drew out a rosary. "'Now, sir, do you believe me?' "'It was felony to possess these things, and Anthony had no more doubts. "'Yes,' he said, and I ask your pardon, and he gave back the on you stay. "'But there is no sedition in this?' "'None, sir, I give you my word,' said the man, apparently greatly relieved, and sinking back on his pillow. I will tell you all, and you can judge for yourself, but you will promise to be secret. And when Anthony had given his word, he went on. M Mass was to have been said in Newman's Court on Sunday at number three, but that cursed spy, Walsingham, hath had wind of it. His men have been lurking round there, and it is not safe however there is no need to say that to mr maxwell he will understand enough if you will give him a message of half a dozen words from me mr roger you can tell him that you saw me if you wish to but ah oh, sir you give me your word to say no more to any one not even to mr maxwell himself for it is in a public place and then i will tell you the place and the message but we must be swift because the time is near it is at five of the clock that he will look for a messenger i give you my word said anthony well sir the place is papist corner in the cathedral and the words are these come for all things are now ready you know, sir, that we Catholics go in fear of our lives, and like the poor hares have to double and turn if we would escape. If any overhears that message, he will never know it to be a warning. And it was for that that I asked your word to say no more than your message, with just the word that you had seen me yourself. You may tell him, of course, sir, that mr roger has a patch over his eye and stuttered a little in his speech and he will know it is from me then now sir will you tell me what the message is and the place to be sure that you know them and then sir it will be time to go and god bless you sir god bless you for your kindness to us poor papists the man seized anthony's gloved hand and kissed it fervently once or twice anthony repeated his instructions carefully he was more touched than he cared to show by the evident gratitude and relief of this poor terrified catholic Th that is right sir that is right and now sir if you please be gone at once or the father will have left the cathedral the child will be in the court below to show you the way out to the churchyard god bless you sir and reward you for your kindness and as anthony went out of the room he heard benedictions mingled with sobs following him the woman was nowhere to be seen so he took the oil lamp from the landing and found his way downstairs again unfastened the front door and went out leaving the lamp on the floor 
The child was leaning against the wall opposite. He could just see the glimmer of her face in the heavy dusk. "'Come, my child,' he said, "'show me the way to the churchyard.' She came forward, and he began to follow her out of the little flagged court. He turned around as he left the court and saw high up against the blackness overhead a square of window lighted with a glow from within, and simultaneously there came the sound of bolts being shut in the door that he had just left. Evidently the old woman had been on the watch and was now barring the door behind him. It wanted courage to do as Anthony was doing, but he was not lacking in that. It was not a small matter to go to Papist Corner and give a warning to a Catholic priest. But firstly, James Maxwell was his friend, and in danger. Secondly, Anthony had no sympathy with religious persecution. And thirdly, as has been seen, the last year had made a really deep impression upon him. He was more favorably inclined to the Catholic cause than he had ever imagined to be possible. As he followed the child through the labyrinth of passages, passing every now and then the lighted front of a house or a little group of idlers, for the rain had now ceased, who stared to see this gentleman in such company, his head was whirling with questions and conjectures. Was it not, after all, a dishonorable act to the archbishop in whose service he was, thus to take the side of the papists? but that it was too late to consider now how strange that james maxwell was a priest that of course accounted at once for his long absence no doubt in the seminary abroad and his ultimate return and for hubert's inheriting the estates and then he passed on to reflect as he had done a hundred times before on this wonderful religion that allured men from home and wealth and friends and sent them rejoicing to penury suspicion hatred peril and death itself for the kingdom of heaven's sake suddenly he found himself in the open space opposite the cathedral the child had again disappeared it was less dark here the leaden sky overhead still glimmered with a pale sunset light and many house windows shone out from within he passed round the south side of the cathedral and entered the western door the building was full of deep gloom only pricked here and there by an oil lamp or two that would presently be extinguished when the cathedral was closed the air was full of a faint sound made up from echoes of the outside world and the footsteps of a few people who still lingered in groups here and there in the aisles and talked among themselves the columns rose up in slender bundles and faded into the pale gloom overhead as he crossed the nave on the way to papist corner far away to the east rose the dark carving of the stalls against the glimmering stone beyond it was like some vast hall of the dead the noise of the footsteps seemed like an insolent intrusion on this temple of silence and the religious stillness had an active and sombre character of its own more eloquent and impressive than all the tumult that man could make as anthony came to papist corner he saw a very tall solitary figure passing slowly from east to west it was too dark to distinguish faces so he went towards it so that at the next turn they would meet face to face when he was within two or three steps the man before him turned abruptly and anthony immediately put out his hand smiling mr arthur oldham he said the man started and peered curiously through the gloom at him why anthony he exclaimed and took his hand what is your business here and they began slowly to walk westwards together i am come to meet mr oldham he said and to give him a message and this is it come for all things are now ready my dear boy said james stopping short you must forgive me but what in the world do you mean by that i come from mr roger said anthony you need not be afraid he has had an accident and sent for me mr roger said james interrogatively yes said anthony he hath a patch over one eye and stutters somewhat 
James gave a sigh of relief. My dear boy, he said, I cannot thank you enough. You know what it means, then? Why, yes, said Anthony. And you, a Protestant, and in the Archbishop's household? Why, yes, said Anthony, and a Christian, and your friend. God bless you, Anthony, said the priest, and took his hand and pressed it. They were passing out now under the west door, and stood together for a moment looking at the lights down Ludgate Hill. The houses about Amen Court stood up against the sky to their right. "'I must not stay,' said Anthony. "'I must fetch my horse and be back at Lambeth for evening prayers at six. He's stabled at the palace here.' "'Well, well,' said the priest, "'I thank God that there are true hearts like yours.' god bless you again my dear boy and and make you one of us some day anthony smiled at him a little tremulously for the gratitude and the blessing of this man was dear to him and after another hand grasp he turned away to the right leaving the priest still half under the shadow of the door looking after him he had done his errand promptly and discreetly end of chapter seven Part two, chapter eight of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Massing House. Newman's Court lay dark and silent under the stars on Sunday morning a little after four o'clock. The gloomy weather of the last three or four days had passed off in heavy battalions of sullen sunset clouds on the preceding evening and the air was full of frost by midnight thin ice was lying everywhere pendants of it were beginning to form on the overhanging eaves and streaks of it between the cobblestones that paved the court the great city lay in a frosty stillness as of death the patrol passed along cheapside forty yards away from the entrance of the court a little after three o'clock and a watchman had cried out half an hour later that it was a clear night and then he too had gone his way the court itself was a little rectangular enclosure with two entrances one to the north between the arch of a stable that gave on to newman's passage which in its turn opened on to st giles lane that led to cheapside the other at the further end of the long right-hand side led by a labyrinth of passages down in the direction of the wharfs to the west of london bridge there were three houses to the left of the entrance from newman's passage the back of a warehouse faced them on the other long side with the door beyond and the other two sides were respectively formed by the archway of the stable with a loft over it and a blank high wall at the opposite end a few minutes after four o'clock the figure of a woman suddenly appeared soundlessly in the arch under the stables and after standing there a moment advanced along the front of the houses till she reached the third door she stood here a moment in silence listening and looking towards the doorway opposite and then rapped gently with her fingernail eleven or twelve times almost immediately the door opened showing only darkness within she stepped in and closed it silently behind her then the minutes slipped away again in undisturbed silence at about twenty minutes to five the figure of a very tall man dressed as a layman slipped in through the door that led towards the river and advanced to the door where he tapped in the same manner as the woman before him and was admitted at once after that people began to come more frequently some hesitating and looking about them as they entered the court some slipping straight through without a pause and going to the door which opened and shut noiselessly as each tapped and was admitted sometimes two or three would come together sometimes singly but by five o'clock about twenty or thirty persons had come and been engulfed by the blackness that showed each time the door opened while no glimmer of light from any of the windows betrayed the presence of any living soul within at five o'clock the stream stopped the little court lay as silent under the stars again as an hour before it was a night of breathless stillness there was no dripping from the eaves no sound of wheels or hoofs from the city 
Only once or twice came the long howl of a dog across the roofs. Ten minutes passed away. Then, without a sound, a face appeared like a pale floating patch in the dark door that opened on to the court. It remained hung like a mask in the darkness for at least a minute, and then a man stepped through onto the cobblestones. Something on his head glimmered sharply in the starlight, and there was the same sparkle at the end of a pole that he carried in his hand. He turned and nodded, and three or four men appeared behind him. Then out of the darkness of the archway at the other end of the court appeared a similar group. Once a man slipped on the frozen stones and cursed under his breath, and the leader turned on him with a fierce indrawing of his breath, but no word was spoken. Then through both entrances streamed dark figures, each with a steely glitter on his head and breast, and with something that shone in their hands, till the little court seemed half full of armed men. But the silence was still formidable in its depth. The two leaders came together to the door of the third house, and their heads were together, and a few sibilant consonants escaped them. The breath of the men that stood out under the starlight went up like smoke in the air. It was now a quarter past five. Three notes of a handbell sounded behind the house. And then, without any further attempt at silence, the men who had entered the court first advanced to the door and struck three or four thundering blows on it with a mace, and shouted in a resonant voice, "'Open in the Queen's name!' The men relaxed their cautious attitudes, and some grounded their weapons. Others began to talk, in low voices. A small party advanced nearer their leaders with weapons, axes, and halberds uplifted. By now the blows were thundering on the door, and the same shattering voice cried again and again, "'Open in the Queen's name! Open in the Queen's name!' The middle house of the three was unoccupied, but the windows of the house next to the stable, and the windows in the loft over the archway, where the stable boys slept, suddenly were illuminated, latches were lifted, the windows thrust open, and heads out of them. Then one or two more pursuivants came up the dark passage, bearing flaming torches with them. A figure appeared on the top of the blank wall at the end, and pointed and shouted. The stable boys in a moment more appeared in their archway, and one or two persons came out of the house next the stable, queerly habited in cloaks and hats over their night attire. The din was now tremendous. The questions and answers, shouted to and fro, were scarcely audible under the thunder that pealed from the battered door. A party had advanced to it, and were raining blows upon the lock and hinges. The court was full of a ruddy glare that blazed on the half-armor and pikes of the men, and the bellowing and the crashes and the smoke together went up into the night air as from the infernal pit. It was a hellish transformation from the deathly stillness of a few minutes, a massacre of the sweet night silence and yet the house where the little silent stream of dark figures had been swallowed up rose up high above the smoky cauldron black dark and irresponsive there rose a shrill howling from behind the house and the figure on the top of the wall capered and gesticulated again then footsteps came running up the passage and a pursuivant thrust his way through to the leaders, and in a moment or two, above the din, a sharp word was given, and three or four men hurried out through the doorway by which the man had come. Almost at the same moment the hinges of the door gave way, the hole crashed inwards, and the attacking party poured into the dark entrance hall beyond. By this time the noise had wakened many in the houses round, and lights were beginning to shine from the high windows invisible before, and a concourse of people to press in from all sides. The approaches had all been guarded, but at the crash of the door some of the sentries round the nearer corners hurried into the court, and the crowd poured after them, and by the time that the officers and men had disappeared into the house, their places had been filled by the spectators, and the little court was again full of a swaying, seething, shouting mass of men, with a few women with hoods and cloaks among them. Inquiries and information were yelled to and fro. It was a nest of papists. A wasp nest was being smoked out. What harm had they done? 
it was a murder two women had had their throats cut no no it was a papist den a massing house well god save her grace and rid her of her enemies with these damned spaniards everywhere england was going to ruin they had escaped at the back no they tried that way but it was guarded there were over fifty papists some said in that house it was a plot mary was mixed up in it the queen was to be blown up with powder like poor darnley the barrels were all stored there no 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 it was nothing but a massing house who was the priest well they would see him at tyburn on a hurdle and serve him right with his treasonable mummery no no they had had enough of blood campion had died like a man and an englishman too praying for his queen the incessant battle and roar went up meanwhile lights were beginning to shine everywhere in the dark house a man with a torch was standing in a smoky glare halfway up the stairs seen through the door and the interior of the plain hall was illuminated then the leaded panes overhead were beginning to shine out steel caps moved to and fro gigantic shadows wavered the shadow of a halberd head went across a curtain at one of the lower windows a crimson-faced man threw open a window and shouted instructions to the sentry left at the door who in answer shook his head and pointed to the bellowing crowd the man at the window made a furious gesture and disappeared the illumination began to climb higher and higher as the searchers mounted from floor to floor thin smoke began to go up from one or two of the chimneys in the frosty air they were lighting straw to bring down any fugitives concealed in the chimneys then the sound of heavy blows began to ring out they were testing the walls everywhere for hiding holes there was a sound of rending wood as the flooring was torn up then over the parapet against the stairs looked a steel-crowned face of a pursuivant the crowd below yelled and pointed at first thinking he was a fugitive but he grinned down at them and disappeared then at last came an exultant shout then a breathless silence then the crowd began to question and answer again they had caught the priest no the priest had escaped damn him it was half a dozen women no no they had had the women ten minutes ago in a room at the back what fools these pursuivants were they had found the chapel and the altar what a show it would all make at the trial ah ah it was the priest after all those nearest to the door saw the man with the torch on the stairs stand back a little and then a dismal little procession began to appear round the turn first came a couple of armed men looking behind them every now and then then a group of half a dozen women whom they had found almost immediately but had been keeping for the last few minutes in a room upstairs then a couple more men then there was a little space then more constables and more prisoners each male prisoner was guarded by two men the women were in groups all these came out to the court the crowd began to sway back against the walls pointing and crying out and a lane with living walls was formed towards the archway that opened into newman's passage when the last pursuivants who had brought up the rear had reached the door an officer who had been leaning from a first-floor window with the pale face of lackington peering over his shoulder gave a sharp order and the procession halted the women numbering fourteen or fifteen were placed in a group with some eight men in a hollow square round them then came a dozen men each with a pursuivant on either side but plainly they were not all come they were still waiting for something the officer and lackington disappeared from the window and for a moment too the crowd was quiet a murmur of excitement began to rise again as another group was seen descending the stairs within the officer came first looking back and talking as he came then followed two pursuivants with halberds and immediately behind them followed by yet two men walked james maxwell in crimson vestments all disordered with his hands behind him and his comely head towering above the heads of the guard the crowd surged forward yelling and the men at the door grounded their halberds sharply on the feet of the front row of spectators as the priest reached the door a shrill cry either from a boy or a woman 
pierced the roaring of the mob. "'God bless you, father!' And as he heard it, he turned and smiled serenely. His face was white, and there was a little trickle of blood run down across it from some wound in his head. The rest of the prisoners turned towards him as he came out, and again he smiled and nodded at them. And so the Catholics, with their priest, stood a moment in that deafening tumult of revilings, before the officer gave the word to advance. Then the procession set forward through the archway, the crowd pressing back before them, like the recoil of a wave, and surging after them again in the wake. High over the heads of all moved the steel halberds, shining like grim emblems of power, the torches tossed up and down and threw monstrous stalking shadows on the walls as they passed the steel caps edged the procession like an impenetrable hedge and last moved the crimson-clad priest as if in some church function but with a bristling barrier about him then came the mob pouring along the narrow passages jostling cursing reviling swelled every moment by new arrivals dashing down the alleys and courts that gave on the thoroughfare and so with tramp and ring of steel the pageant went forward on its way of sorrows before six o'clock newman's court was empty again except for one armed figure that stood before the shattered door of number three to guard it inside the house was dark again except in one room high up where the altar had stood here the thick curtains against the glass had been torn down and the window was illuminated every now and again the shadows on the ceiling stirred a little as if the candle was being moved and once the window opened and a pale smooth face looked out for a moment and then withdrew again then the light disappeared altogether and presently shone out in another room on the same floor then again after an half an hour or so it was darkened and again reappeared on the floor below and so it went on from room to room until the noises of the waking city began and the stars paled and expired over the smokeless town the sky began to glow clear and brilliant the crowing of cocks awoke here and there a church bell or two began to sound far away over the roofs the pale blue overhead grew more and more luminous the candle went out on the first floor the steel-clad man stretched himself and looked at the growing dawn a step was heard on the stairs and lackington came down carrying a small valise apparently full to bursting he looked paler than usual and a little hollow-eyed for want of sleep he came out and stood by the soldier and looked about him everywhere the court showed signs of the night's tumult crumbled ice from broken icicles and trampled frozen pools lay powdered on the stones here and there on the walls were great smears of black from the torches and even one or two torn bits of stuff and a crushed hat marked where the pressure had been fiercest most eloquent of all was the splintered door behind him still held fast by one stout bolt but leaning crookedly against the dinted wall of the interior a good night's work friend said lackington to the man another hive taken and here and he tapped his valise here i bear the best of the honey the soldier looked heavily at the bag he was tired too and he did not care for this kind of work well said lackington again i must be getting home safe keep the door you shall be relieved in one hour the soldier nodded at him but still said nothing and lackington lifted the valise and went off too under the archway that same morning lady maxwell in her room in the hall at great keynes awoke early before dawn with a start she had had a dream but could not remember what it was except that her son james was in it and seemed to be in trouble he was calling on her to save him she thought and awoke at the sound of his voice she often dreamt of him at this time for the life of a seminary priest was laid with snares and dangers but this dream seemed worse than all she struck a light and looked timidly round the room it seemed still ringing with his voice 
a great tapestry in a frame hung over the mantelpiece acteon followed by his hounds the hunter panted as he ran and was looking back over his shoulder and the long-jawed dog streamed behind him down a little hill so strong was the dream upon the old lady that she felt restless and presently got up and went to the window and opened a shutter to look out a white statue or two beyond the terrace glimmered in the dusk and the stars were bright in the clear frosty night overhead she closed the shutter and went back again to bed but could not sleep again and again as she was dozing off something would startle her wide awake again sometimes it was a glimpse of james's face sometimes he seemed to be hurrying away from her down an endless passage with closed doors he was dressed in something crimson she tried to cry out her voice would not rise above a whisper sometimes it was the dream of his voice and once she started up crying out i am coming my son then at last she awoke again at the sound of footsteps coming along the corridor outside and stared fearfully at the door to see what would enter but it was only the maid come to call her mistress lady maxwell watched her as she opened the shutters that now glimmered through their cracks and let a great flood of light into the room from the clear shining morning outside it is a frosty morning my lady said the maid send one of the men down to mistress torridon said lady maxwell and ask her to come here as soon as it is convenient say i am well but would like to see her when she can come there was no priest in the house that sunday so there could be no mass and on these occasions mistress margaret usually stayed at the dower house until after dinner but this morning she came up within half an hour of receiving the message she did not pretend to despise her sister's terror or call it superstitious mary she said taking her sister's jewelled old fingers into her own two hands we must leave all this to the good god it may mean much or little or nothing he only knows but at least we may pray let me tell isabel a child's prayers are mighty with him and she has the soul of a little child still so isabel was told and after church she came up to dine at the hall and spend the day there for lady maxwell was thoroughly nervous and upset she trembled at the sound of footsteps and cried out when one of the men came into the room suddenly isabel went again to evening prayer at three o'clock but could not keep her thoughts off the strange nervous horror at the hall though it seemed to rest on no better foundation than the waking dreams of an old lady and her mind strayed away continually from the darkening chapel in which she sat so near where sir nicholas himself lay to the upstairs parlour where the widow sat shaken and trembling at her own curious fancies about her dear son mr bodder's sermon came to an end at last and isabel was able to get away and hurry back to the hall she found the old ladies as she had left them in the little drawing-room lady maxwell sitting on the window-seat near the harp preoccupied and apparently listening for something she knew not what mistress margaret was sitting in a tall padded porter's chair reading aloud from an old english mystic but her sister was paying no attention and looking strangely at the girl as she came in isabel sat down near the fire and listened and as she listened the memory of that other day years ago came to her when she sat once before with these two ladies in the same room and mistress margaret read to them and a letter came from sir nicholas and then the sudden clamour from the village so now she sat with terror darkening over her glancing now and again at that white expectant face and herself listening for the first far-away rumour of the dreadful interruption that she knew must come the goodness of god read the old nun is the highest prayer and it cometh down to the lowest part of our need 
it quickeneth our soul and bringeth it on life and maketh it for to waxen in grace and virtue it is nearest in nature and readiest in grace for it is the same grace that the soul seeketh and ever shall seek till we know verily that he hath us all in himself enclosed for he hath no despite of that he hath made nor hath he any disdain to serve us at the simplest office that to our body belongeth in nature for love of the soul that he hath made to his own likeness for as the body is clad in the clothes and the flesh in the skin and the bones in the flesh and the heart in the whole so are we soul and body clad in the goodness of god and enclosed yea and more homely for all these may waste and wear away but the goodness of god is ever a whole and more near to us without any likeness for truly our lover desireth that our soul cleave to him with all its might and that we be ever more cleaving to his goodness for of all things that heart may think this most pleaseth god and soon speedeth us for our soul is so specially loved of him that is highest that it overpasseth the knowing of all creatures hush said lady maxwell suddenly on her feet with a lifted hand there was a breathless silence in the room isabel's heart beat thick and heavy and her eyes grew large with expectancy it was a windless frosty night again and the ivy outside on the wall and the laurels in the garden seemed to be silently listening too mary uh, mary began her sister you but the old lady lifted her hand a little higher and silence fell again then far away in the direction of the london road came the clear beat of the hoofs of a galloping horse lady maxwell bowed her head and her hand slowly sank to her side the other two stood up and remained still while the beat of the hoofs grew and grew in intensity on the frozen road the front door said lady maxwell mistress margaret slipped from the room and went downstairs isabel took a step or two forward but was checked by the old lady's uplifted hand again and again there was a breathless silence save for the beat of the hoofs now close and imminent a moment later the front door was opened and a great flood of cold air swept up the passages the portrait of sir nicholas in the hall downstairs lifted and rattled against the wall then came the clatter on the paved court and the sound of a horse suddenly checked with the slipping up of hoofs and the jingle and rattle of chains and stirrups there were voices in the hall below and a man's deep tones then came steps ascending lady maxwell still stood perfectly rigid by the window waiting and isabel stared with white face and great open eyes at the door outside the flame of a lamp on the wall was blowing about furiously in the draught then a stranger stepped into the room evidently a gentleman he bowed to the two ladies and stood with the rhyme on his boots and a whip in his hand a little exhausted and disordered by hard riding lady maxwell he said lady maxwell bowed a little i come with news of your son madam the priest he is alive and well but he is in trouble he was taken this morning in his massed vestments and is in the marshalsea lady maxwell's lips moved a little but no sound came he was betrayed madam by a friend he and thirty other catholics were taken all together at mass then lady maxwell spoke and her voice was dead and hard the friend sir what was his name the traitor's name madam is anthony norris the room turned suddenly dark to isabel's eyes and she put up her hand and tore at the collar around her throat oh no 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 she cried and taught her to step her two forward and stood swaying 
lady maxwell looked from one to another with eyes that seemed to see nothing and her lips stirred again mistress margaret who had followed the stranger up and who stood now behind him at the door came forward to isabel with a little cry with her hands trembling before her but before she could reach her lady maxwell herself came swiftly forward her head thrown back and her arms stretched out towards the girl who still stood dazed and swaying more and more my poor poor child said lady maxwell and caught her as she fell End of chapter 8part two chapter nine of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain from fulham to greenwich anthony in london strangely enough heard nothing of the arrest on the sunday except a rumour at supper that some papists had been taken it had sufficient effect on his mind to make him congratulate himself that he had been able to warn his friend last week at dinner on monday there were a few guests and among them one sir richard barclay afterwards lieutenant of the tower he sat at the archbishop's table but anthony's place on the steward's left hand brought him very close to the end of the first table where sir richard sat dinner was halfway through when mr scott who was talking to anthony was suddenly silent and lifted his hand as if to check the conversation a moment i saw them myself said sir richard's voice just behind what is it whispered anthony the catholics answered the steward they were taken in newman's court off cheapside went on the voice nearly thirty with one of their priests at mass in his trinkets too oldham his name is there was a sudden crash of a chair fallen backwards and anthony was standing by the officer i beg your pardon sir richard barclay he said and a dead silence fell in the hall but is that the name of the priest that was taken yesterday sir richard looked astonished at the apparent insolence of this young official yes sir he said shortly then then began anthony but stopped bowed low to the archbishop and went straight out of the hall mr scott was waiting for him in the hall when he returned late that night anthony's face was white and distracted he came in and stood by the fire and stared at him with a dazed air you are to come to his grace said the steward looking at him in silence anthony nodded without speaking and turned away then you cannot tell me anything said mr scott the other shook his head impatiently and walked towards the inner door the archbishop was sincerely shocked at the sight of his young officer as he came in and stood before the table staring with bewildered eyes with his dress splashed and disordered and his hands still holding the whip and gloves he made him sit down at once and after anthony had drunk a glass of wine he made him tell his story and what he had done that day he had been to the marshalsea it was true mr oldham was there and had been examined mr young had conducted it the house at newman's court was guarded the house behind bow church was barred and shut up and the people seemed gone away he could not get a word through to mr oldham though he had tried heavy bribery and that was all anthony spoke with the same dazed air in short broken sentences but became more himself as the wine and the fire warmed him and by the time he had finished he had recovered himself enough to entreat the archbishop to help him it is useless said the old man what can i do i have no power and and he is a popish priest how can i interfere my lord cried anthony desperately flushed and entreating all has been done through treachery do you not see it i have been a brainless fool that man behind bow church was a spy for christ's sake help us my lord grindal looked into the lad's great bright eyes sighed and threw out his hands despairingly it is useless indeed it is useless mr norris but i will tell you all that i can do i will give you to-morrow a letter to sir francis walsingham 
I was with him abroad, as you know, in the popish times of Mary, and he is still in some sort a friend of mine, but you must remember that he is a strong Protestant, and I do not suppose that he will help you. Now go to bed, dear lad, you are worn out. Anthony knelt for the old man's blessing and left the room. The interview next day was more formidable than he had expected. He was at the secretary's house by ten o'clock, and waited below while the archbishop's letter was taken up. The servant came back in a few minutes and asked him to follow, and in an agony of anxiety, but with a clear head again this morning, and every faculty tense, he went upstairs after him and was ushered into the room where Walsingham sat at a table. There was silence as the two bowed, but Sir Francis did not offer to rise but sat with the archbishop's letter in his hand, glancing through it again as the other stood and waited. "'I understand,' said the secretary at last, and his voice was dry and unsympathetic. "'I understand, from his grace's letter, that you desire to aid a popish priest called Oldham, or Maxwell, arrested at Mass on Sunday morning in Newman's Court.' if you will be so good as to tell me in what way you desire to aid him i can be more plain in my answer you do not desire i hope mr norris anything but justice and a fair trial for your friend anthony cleared his throat before answering i he is my friend as you say sir francis and and he hath been caught by foul means i myself was used as i have little doubt in his capture surely there is no justice sir in betraying a man by means of his friend and anthony described the ruse that had brought it all about sir francis listened to him coldly but there came the faintest spark of amusement into his large sad eyes surely mr norris he said it was somewhat simple and i have no doubt at all that it all is as you say and that the poor stuttering cripple with a patch was as sound and had as good sight and power of speech as you and i but the plan was it seems if you will forgive me not so simple as yourself it would be passing strange surely that the man if a friend of the priests could find no catholic to take his message but not at all strange if he were his enemy i do not think sincerely sir that it would have deceived me but that is not now the point he is taken now fairly or foully and what was it you wished me to do i hoped said anthony in rising indignation at this insolence that you would help me in some way to to undo this foul injustice surely sir it cannot be right to take advantage of such knavish tricks good mr norris said the secretary we are not playing a game with rules that must not be broken but we are trying to serve justice his voice rose a little in sincere enthusiasm and to put down all false practices whether in religion or state against god or the prince surely the point for you and me is not ought this gentleman to have been taken in the manner he was but being taken is he innocent or guilty then you will not help me i will certainly not help you to defeat justice said the other mr norris you are a young man and while your friendship does your heart credit your manner of forwarding its claims does not equally commend your head i counsel you to be wary in your speech and actions or they may bring you into trouble some day yourself after all as no doubt your friends have told you you played what as a minister of the crown i must call a knave's part in attempting to save this popish traitor although by god's providence you were frustrated but it is indeed going too far to beg me to assist you i have never heard of such audacity anthony left the house in a fury it was true as the archbishop had said that sir francis walsingham was a convinced protestant but he had expected to find in him some indignation at the methods by which the priest had been captured and some desire to make compensation for it he went again to the marshalsea and now heard that james had been removed 
to the tower with one or two of the catholics who had been in trouble before this was serious news for to be transferred to the tower was often but the prelude to torture or death he went on there however and tried again to gain admittance but it was refused and the doorkeeper would not even consent to take a message in mr oldham he said was being straitly kept and it would be as much as his place was worth to admit any communication to him without an order from the council when anthony got back to lambeth after this fruitless day he found an imploring note from isabel awaiting him and one of the grooms from the hall to take his answer back write back at once dear anthony she wrote and explain this terrible thing for i know well that you could not do what has been told us of you but tell us what has happened that we may know what to think poor lady maxwell is in the distress you may imagine not knowing what will come to mr james she will come to london i think this week write at once now my anthony and tell us all anthony scribbled a few lines saying how he had been deceived and asking her to explain the circumstances to lady maxwell who no doubt would communicate them to her son as soon as was possible he added that he had so far failed to get a message through the jailer he gave the note himself to the groom telling him to deliver it straight into isabel's hands and then went to bed in the morning he reported to the archbishop what had taken place i feared it would be so grindal said there is nothing to be done but to commit your friend into god's hands and leave him there my lord said anthony i cannot leave it like that i will go and see my lord bishop to-day and then if he can do nothing to help i will even see the queen's grace herself grindal threw up his hands with a gesture of dismay that will ruin all he said an officer of mine could do nothing but anger her grace i must do my best said anthony it was through my folly that he is in prison and i could never rest if i left one single thing undone just as anthony was leaving the house a servant in the royal livery dashed up to the gate and the porter ran out after anthony to call him back the man delivered to him a letter which he opened then and there it was from mistress corbett what can be done the letter ran for poor mr james i've heard a tale of you from a catholic which i know is a black lie i am sure that even now you will be doing all you can to save your friend i told the man that told me that he lied and that i knew you for an honest gentleman but come dear mr anthony and we will do what we can between us her grace noticed this morning that i had been weeping i put her off with excuses that she knows to be excuses and she is so curious that she will not rest till she knows the cause come after dinner to-day we are at greenwich now and we will see what may be done it may even be needful for you to see her grace yourself and tell her the story your loving friend mary corbett anthony gave a message to the royal groom to tell mistress corbett that he would do as she said and then rode off immediately to the city there was another disappointing delay as the bishop was at fulham and thither he rode directly through the frosty streets under the keen morning sunshine fretting at the further delay he had often had occasion to see the bishop before and aylmer had taken something of a liking to this staunch young churchman and now as the young man came hurrying across the grass under the elms the bishop who was walking in his garden in his furs and flapped cap noticed his anxious eyes and troubled face and smiled at him kindly wondering what he had come about the two began to walk up and down together the sunshine was beginning to melt the surface of the ground and the birds were busy with breakfast hunting look at that little fellow cried the bishop pointing to a thrush on the lawn he knows his craft the thrush had just rapped several times with his beak at a worm's earth and was waiting with his head sideways watching aha cried the bishop again he has him the thrush had seized the worm who had come up to investigate the noise and was now staggering backwards bracing himself and tugging at the poor worm who in a moment more was dragged out and swallowed my lord 
said Anthony, I came to ask your pity for one who was betrayed by like treachery. Bishop looked astonished and asked for the story, but when he heard who it was that had been taken and under what circumstances, the kindliness died out of his eyes. He shook his head severely when Anthony had done. It is useless coming to me, sir, he said. You know what I think. To be ordained beyond the seas and to exercise priestly functions in England is now a crime. It is useless to pretend anything else. It is revolt against the Queen's grace and the peace of the realm. And I must confess I am astonished at you, Mr. Norris, thinking that anything ought to be done to shield a criminal, and still more astonished that you should think I would aid you in that. I tell you plainly that I am glad that the fellow is caught for that i think there will be presently one less firebrand in england i know it is easy to cry out against persecution and injustice that is ever the shallow cry of the mob but this is not a religious persecution as you yourself very well know it is because the roman church interferes with the peace of the realm and the queen's authority that its ordinances are forbidden we do not seek to touch a man's private opinions however you know all that as well as i anthony was raging now with anger i am not so sure my lord as i was he said i had hoped from your lordship at any rate to find sympathy for the base trick whereby my friend was snared and i find it now hard to trust the judgment of any who do not feel as i do about it that is insolence mr norris said aylmer stopping in his walk and turning upon him his cold half-shut eyes and i will not suffer it then my lord i had better be gone to her grace at once to her grace exclaimed the bishop apello caesarum said anthony and was gone again as anthony came into the courtyard of greenwich palace an hour or two later he found it humming with movement and noise cooks were going to and fro with dishes as dinner was only just ending servants in the royal livery were dashing across with messages a few great hounds for the afternoon's baiting were in a group near one of the gateways snuffing the smell of cookery and howling hungrily now and again anthony stopped one of the men and sent him with a message to mistress corbett and the servant presently returned saying that the court was just rising from dinner and mistress corbett would see him in a parlour directly if the gentleman would kindly follow him a groom took his horse off to the stable and anthony himself followed the servant to a little oak parlour looking on to a lawn with a yew hedge and a dial he felt as one moving in a dream bewildered by the rush of interviews and oppressed by the awful burden that he bore at his heart nothing any longer seemed strange and he scarcely gave a thought to what it meant when he heard the sound of trumpets in the court as the queen left the hall in five minutes more mistress corbett burst into the room and her anxious look broke into tenderness at the sight of the misery on the lad's face oh master anthony she cried seizing his hand thank god you are here and now what is to be done for him they sat down together in the window-seat mary was dressed in an elaborate rose-coloured costume but her pretty lips were pale and her eyes looked distressed and heavy i have hardly slept she said since saturday night tell me all that you know anthony told her the whole story mechanically and miserably Ah. Oh she said that was how it was i understand it now and what can we do you know of course that he has been questioned in the tower anthony turned suddenly white and sick not the not the he began falteringly she nodded at him mutely with large eyes and compressed lips oh my god said anthony and then again oh god she took up one of his brown young hands and pressed it gently between her white slender ones i know she said i know he is a gallant gentleman anthony stood up shaking and sat down again the horror had goaded him into clearer consciousness 
"Ah, what can we do?" he said brokenly. "Let me see the Queen; she will be merciful." "You must trust to me in this," said Mary. "I know her; and I know that to go to her now would be madness. She is in a fury with Pinart to day at something that has passed about the Duke. You know Monsieur is here. She kissed him the other day; and the Lord only knows whether she will marry him or not. You must wait a day or two, and be ready when I tell you." "But," stammered Anthony, "every hour we wait he suffers." "Oh, you cannot tell that," said Mary. "They give them a long rest sometimes, and it was only yesterday that he was questioned." Anthony sat silently, staring out on the fresh lawn. There was still a patch of frost under the shadow of the hedge, he noticed. "'Wait here a moment,' said Mary, looking at him, and she got up and went out. Anthony still sat, staring and thinking of the horror. Presently Mary was at his side again with a tall Venetian wine-glass brimming with white wine. "'Here,' she said, "'drink this.' And then, "'Have you dined today? "'There was not time.' said anthony she frowned at him almost fiercely and you come here fasting she said to face the queen you foolish boy you know nothing wait here she added imperiously and again she left the room anthony still stared out of doors twisting the empty glass in his hand until again came her step and the rustle of her dress she took the glass from him and put it down. A servant had followed her back into the room in a minute or two with a dish of meat and some bread. He set it on the table and went out. Now, said Mary, sit down and eat before you speak another word. And Anthony obeyed. The servant presently returned with some fruit and again left them. All the while Anthony was eating, Mary sat by him and told him how she had heard the whole story from another Catholic at court and how the queen had questioned her closely the night before as to what the marks of tears meant on her cheeks it was when i heard of the racking explained mary i could not help it i went up to my room and cried and cried but i would not tell her grace that it would have been of no use so i said i had a headache but i said it in such a way as to prepare her for more she has not questioned me again to-day she is too full of anger and of the bear-baiting but she will she will she never forgets and then mr anthony it must be you to tell her you are a pleasant-faced young man sir and she likes such as that and you must be both forward and modest with her she loves boldness but hates rudeness that is why chris is so beloved by her he is a fool but he is a handsome fool and a forward fool and withal a tender fool and sighs and cries and calls her his goddess and says how he takes to his bed when she's not there which of course is true the other day he came to her white-faced sobbing like a frightened child about the ring she had given monsieur le petit grenouille and oh she was so tender with him and so mr anthony you must not be just forward with her and frown at her and call her jezebel and tyrant as you would like to do but you must call her cleopatra and diana as well forward and backward all in one that is the way she loves to be wooed she is a woman remember that i must just let my heart speak said anthony i cannot twist and turn yes yes said mary that is what i mean but mind that it is your heart they went on talking a little longer when suddenly the trumpets pealed out again mary rose with a look of consternation i must fly she said her grace will be starting for the pit directly and i must be there do you follow mr anthony i will speak to a servant in the court about you and in a moment she was gone when anthony had finished the fruit and wine he felt considerably refreshed and after waiting a few minutes went out into the court again which he found almost deserted except for a servant or two one of these came up to him and said respectfully that mistress corbett had left instructions that mr norris was to be taken to the bear pit 
so anthony followed him through the palace to the back it was a startlingly beautiful sight that his eyes fell upon when he came up the wooden stairs on to the stage that ran around the arena where the sport was just beginning it was an amphitheatre perhaps forty yards across and the seats around it were filled with the most brilliant costumes many of which blazed with jewels hanging over the top of the palisade were rich stuffs and tapestries the queen herself no doubt with alencon was seated somewhere to the right as anthony could see by the canopy with the arms of england and france embroidered upon its front but he was too near to her to be able to catch even a glimpse of her face or figure the awning overhead was furled as the day was so fine and the winter sunshine poured down on the dresses and jewels all the court was there and anthony recognized many great nobles here and there in the specially reserved seats a ceaseless clangor of trumpets and cymbals filled the air and drowned not only the conversation but the terrific noise from the arena where half a dozen great dogs furious with hunger and excited as much by the crowds and the brazen music overhead as by the presence of their fierce adversary were baiting a huge bear chained to a ring in the centre of the sand anthony's heart sank a little as he noticed the ladies of the court applauding and laughing at the abominable scene below no doubt in imitation of their mistress who loved this fierce sport and as he thought of the kind of heart to which he would have to appeal presently so through the winter afternoon the bouts went on the band answered with harsh chords the death of the dogs one by one and welcomed the collapse of the bear with a strident bellowing passage on the great horns and drums and by the time it was over and the spectators rose to their feet anthony's hopes were lower than ever can there be any compassion left he wondered in a woman to whom such an afternoon was nothing more than a charming entertainment by the time he was able to get out of his seat and return to the courtyard the procession had again disappeared but he was escorted by the same servant to the parlour again where mistress corbett presently rustled in you must stay to-night she said as late as possible i wish you could sleep here but we are so crowded with these frenchmen and hollanders that there is not a bed empty queen is in better humour and if the play goes well it may be that a word said even to-night might reach her heart i will tell you when it is over you must be present i will send you supper here directly anthony inquired as to his dress nay nay said mistress corbett that will do very well it is sober and quiet and a little splashed it will appear that you came in such haste that you could not change it her grace likes to see a man hot and in a hurry sometimes and not always like a peacock in the shade and master anthony it suits you very well he asked what time the play would be over and that his horse might be saddled ready for him when he should want it and mary promised to see to it he felt much more himself as he supped alone in the parlour the bewilderment had passed the courage and spirit of mary had infected his own and the stirring strange life of the palace had distracted him from that dreadful brooding into which he had at first sunk when he had finished supper he sat in the window-seat pondering and praying too that the fierce heart of the queen might be melted and that god would give him words to say there was much else too that he thought over as he sat and watched the illuminated windows round the little lawn on which his own looked and heard the distant clash of music from the hall where the queen was supping in state he thought of mary and of her gay and tender nature and of his own boyish love for her that indeed had gone or rather had been transfigured into a brotherly honour and respect both she and he he was beginning to feel had a more majestic task before them than marrying and giving in marriage the religion which made this woman what she was pure and upright in a luxurious and treacherous court tender among hard hearts sympathetic in the midst of selfish lives this religion was beginning to draw this young man with almost irresistible power mary herself was doing her part bravely witnessing in a protestant court to the power of the catholic faith in her own life and he what was he doing 
these last three days were working miracles in him the way he had been received by walsingham and aylmer their apparent inability to see his point of view on this foul bit of treachery the whole method of the government of the day and above all the picture that was floating now before his eyes over the dark lawn of the little cell in the tower and the silent wrenched figure lying upon the straw the gallant gentleman as mary had called him who had reckoned all this price up before he embarked on the life of a priest and was even now paying it gladly and thankfully no doubt all this deepened the previous impressions that anthony's mind had received and as he sat here amid the stir of the royal palace again and again a vision moved before him of himself as a catholic and perhaps but isabel what of isabel and at the thought of her he rose and walked to and fro presently the servant came again to take anthony to the presence chamber where the play was to take place i understand sir from mistress corbett said the man closing the door of the parlour a moment that you are come about mr maxwell i am a catholic too sir and may i say sir god bless and prosper you in this i i beg your pardon sir will you follow me the room was full at the lower end where anthony had to stand as he was not in court dress and he could see really nothing of the play and hear very little either the children of paul's were acting some classical play which he did not know all he could do was to catch a glimpse now and again of the protruding stage with the curtains at the back and the glitter of the armour that the boys wore and hear the songs that were accompanied by a little string band and the clash of the brass at the more martial moments the queen and the duke he could see sat together immediately opposite the stage on raised seats under a canopy a group of halberdiers guarded them and another small company of them was ranged at the sides of the stage anthony could see little more than this and could hear only isolated sentences here and there so broken was the piece by the talking and laughing around him but he did not like to move as mistress corbett had told him to be present so he stood there listening to the undertone talk about him and watching the faces what he did see of the play did not rouse him to any great enthusiasm his heart was too heavy with his errand and it seemed to him that the occasional glimpses he caught of the stage showed him a very tiresome hero dressed in velvet doublet and hose and steel cap strangely unconvincing who spoke his lines pompously and was as unsatisfactory as the slender shrill-voiced boy who representing a woman of marvellous beauty and allurement was supposed to fire the conqueror's blood with passion at last it ended and an orator in apparel of cloth of gold spoke a kind of special epilogue in rhyming meter in praise of the virgin queen and then retired bowing immediately there was a general movement the brass instruments began to blare out and an usher at the door desired those who were blocking the way to step aside to make way for the queen's procession which would shortly pass out anthony himself went outside with one or two more and then stood aside waiting there was a pause and then a hush and the sound of a high rating woman's voice followed by a murmur of laughter in a moment more the door was flung open again and to anthony's surprise mistress corbett came rustling out as the people stepped back to make room her eyes fell on anthony near the door and she beckoned him to follow and he went down the corridor after her followed her silently along a passage or two wondering why she did not speak and then came after her into the same little oak parlour where he had supped a servant followed them immediately with lighted candles which he set down and retired anthony looked at mistress corbett and saw all across her pale cheek the fiery mark of the five fingers of a hand and saw too that her eyes were full of tears and that her breath came unevenly it, it is no use to-night she said with a sob in her voice her grace is angry with me and and began anthony in amazement and she struck me said mary struggling bravely to smile it was all my fault 
and a bright tear or two ran down on to her delicate lace. I was sitting near her grace, and I could not keep my mind off poor James Maxwell, and I suppose I looked grave, because when the play was over she beckoned me up, and, and asked how I liked it, and why I looked so solemn, for she would know. Was it for Scipio Africanus, or some other man? And and I was silent. And Alençon, that little frog-man, burst out laughing, and said to her grace something, something shameful, in French. But I understood, and gave him a look, and her grace saw it, and, and struck me here, before all the court, and bade me be gone. "'Oh, it is shameful!' said Anthony, furiously, his own eyes bright, too, at the sight of this gallant girl and her humiliation. "'You cannot stay here, Mistress Corbett. This is the second time, at least, is it not?' "'Ah, but I must stay,' she said, "'or who will speak for the Catholics? But now it is useless to think of seeing her grace to-night.' Yet to-morrow, maybe, she will be sorry, she often is, and will want to make amends, and then will be our time. So you must be here to-morrow, by dinner-time at least. Oh, Mistress Corbett, said the boy, I wish I could do something. You dear lad, said Mary, and then indeed the tears ran down. Anthony rode back to Lambeth under the stars, anxious and dispirited, and all night long dreamed of pageants and progresses that blocked the street down which he must ride to rescue James. The brazen trumpets rang out whenever he called for help or tried to explain his errand, and Elizabeth rode by, bowing and smiling to all save him. The next day he was at Greenwich again by dinner-time, and again dined by himself in the oak parlour waited upon by the catholic servant he was just finishing his meal when in sailed mary beaming i told you so she said delightedly the queen is sorry she pinched my ear just now and smiled at me and bade me come to her in her private parlour in half an hour and i shall put my petition then so be ready master anthony be ready and of a good courage for please god we shall save him yet anthony looked at her white and scared what shall i say he said speak from your heart sir as you did to me yesterday be bold yet not overbold tell her plainly that he is your friend and that it was through your action he was betrayed say that you love the man she likes loyalty say he say he is a fine upstanding fellow over six feet in height with a good leg she likes a good leg say that he has not a wife and will never have one wives and husbands like her not in spite of la petite granouille and look straight in her face master anthony as you looked in mine yesterday when i was a cry-baby she likes men to do that and then look away as if dazzled by her radiancy she likes that even more anthony looked so bewildered by these instructions that mary laughed in his face here then poor lad she said i will tell you in a word tell the truth and be a man a man she likes that best of all though she likes sheep too such as chris hatton and frogs like the duke and apes like the little spaniard and chattering dancing monkeys like the frenchman and and devils like walsingham but do you be a man and risk it i know you can manage that and mary smiled at him so cheerfully that anthony felt heartened there she said now you look like one but you must have some more wine first i will send it in as i go and now i must go wait here for the message she gave him her hand and he kissed it and she went out nodding and smiling over her shoulder anthony sat miserably on the window seat oh so much depended on him now the queen was in a good humour and such a chance might never occur again 
and meantime james maxwell waited in the tower the minutes passed steps came and went in the passage outside and anthony's heart leaped into his mouth at each sound once the door opened and anthony sprang to his feet trembling but it was only the servant with the wine anthony took it a fiery italian wine and drew a long draught that sent his blood coursing through his veins and set his heart a-beating strongly again and even as he set the cup down the door was open again and a bowing page was there may it please you sir the queen's grace has sent me for you anthony got up swallowed in his throat once or twice and motioned to go the boy went out and anthony followed they went down a corridor or two passing a sentry who let the well-known page and the gentleman pass without challenging ascended a twisted oak staircase went along a gallery with stained glass of heraldic emblems in the windows and paused before a door the page before knocking turned and looked meaningly at anthony who stood with every pulse in his body racing then the boy knocked opened the door anthony entered and the door closed behind him End of chapter nine